So now that we've looked at selection sort, let's move on to a somewhat better algorithm, namely insertion sort. This is the method you'd probably use to sort cards in your hand if you were playing cards. It turns out to be quite a bit better than selection sort, especially in certain situations that are important in practice. So how does it work? You have your initial input list. You first look at the second element and you compare it with the first one. If they're already in the right order relative to each other, you don't do anything. And if they're in the wrong order, you swap them. So now you have two elements which are in the right order. We haven't touched the rest of it. Then we go to the third element and we look here. If it's out of order with this one, then we need to swap. Otherwise, we keep it the same. If we have swapped, we then have to look and see whether this element is out of order with this one. And if it is, we swap it again. Notice that now these three elements are in correct sorted order. If this was in the right order compared to that, means this is bigger than that one, then because this was already in order, that's also bigger than that, and so they're all in the correct order. On the other hand, if we swap this in, so that now this and this are in the right order, then either this element is smaller than that one, in which case we have to swap even further, and then we end up with them in the order here, 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 which is also correct or this element ends up in the middle there, which again is its right place. Basically, we repeatedly push an element backwards until it gets to its right position. And because we're inserting it in something that's already sorted, we just keep increasing the size of the sorted section one by one, and when we get to the end, the sorted section is the entire list, and therefore we have sorted the entire list, so correctness is obvious there. Notice, by the way, that it's clearly more efficient than selection sort, at least some of the time. For example, when we get this element and we compare it with that one, if it turns out that this element is in the right place already, we don't then compare it with that. So we save some comparisons. Selection sort has to do all the comparisons all the time in order to be completely sure that it has the maximum. Now, insertion sort, as we've described it, is a general purpose algorithm. It's comparison based. We haven't used any particular properties of any type of data. And it's also in place. In the end, we're just making swaps or possibly moves backwards. We could track along here till we find the right place to move it and then move it, insert it in the right position. The first one, of course, is what you would do for an array, the swap version. You could use either in the linked list case. Well, here's the first slide of pseudocode for insertion sort. So we start at the second element of the list in line two. We go through to the end. And at the iteration i, we scan backwards to find the correct position to insert a of i. So as long as we're finding elements to the left which are too big, we keep reducing the value of j in line 7 and moving backwards. And then finally in line 8 we put a of i into its correct position. In line 4 we have the check that we haven't somehow made an error at the boundary. So here's the pseudocode for insertion sort. We're going to loop through n minus 1 times, looking at uh, line 2 there. We're going to start at the second element of the array. We save its value in line 3 so that we don't overwrite it. And then we scan backwards using the variable j to find the correct position to insert. We keep going until we find a place that we should stop because the element to the left is 
small relative to the element K. And then we just, in line 9, ensure that we insert our original element A of I in the correct position. So here's the second version of insertion sort, where we do swaps each time instead of scanning back to finding where to insert. Remember, this is going to be more useful in the case of an array implementation rather than a linked list. Again, we run through from the second element all the way to the end, in line 2 there. And we basically just get the element that we're interested in and swap it backwards until it gets into its correct place. Very simple. Now let's have a look at an example. Now let's have a look at insertion sort. We start at the second element. It's too small compared to its left neighbor, so it has to swap. Now we have a sorted initial sublist of size 2. We then move to the next. It's also too small, so it must swap back. And it must continue to swap until it gets to its correct position. Similarly, 4 must swap back past the 6. Now we already have half of the array sorted. We keep on going. One has to swap all the way back. We know it's going to go right to the front. If we had a little more space on this table, we could do the insertion version without the swaps. But that will require us to push the cards out too wide to be able to see them. So basically we used an array type set up here. We now come to here, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, and now we have to swap back. Keep on swapping until we finally reach the correct position for that one. And now the 5 has to swap into its correct position and then we're going to be done. So let's do a little bit of analysis of insertion sorts running time. Now the first thing we have to notice is that it's different from selection sort. The running time depends on the input. So suppose you have an input that's just already in sorted order. There's very little work to do here. Okay? All we have to do is check this one against that one. Don't move anything. Check this one against this one. Don't move anything. We have to do n minus 1 comparisons, and we don't have to do any moves at all. On the other hand, if we have it around the other way, we're obviously going to have to do a lot more. In this case, we certainly have to move this one past this one, and then this one has to get moved past these, etc. A lot more moves. And in fact, we'll be doing more comparisons once we've got this part all done. This one will have to be moved to its correct position, and we can't do that without comparing every time. It's going to be a lot more comparisons than there will be in the case where it's already sorted. In general, what are we going to have? Suppose we have something like this as our initial input list. Let's think about the number of moves we have to do. So we've got A2 here. We compare them. If these things are already in the correct order, then there are no moves. If they're not in the correct order, we have to do one swap or one move to move this a second one past the first one. Then we have something in the correct order. And then we have to look at the third element. The number of moves we have to do depends on what's going on here and here. If this element is less than this one, then it has to be moved. And if it's less than that one, it has to be moved. But if it's greater than this one, there's no moving required. And then we don't even need to check against here. 
This thing is sorted, it's just permuted these elements here without affecting anything to the right. So with any luck, you're seeing a pattern here. At each step, the number of moves required is just the number of elements to the left, which are too big relative to the element we're moving. Once we reach an element which is not too big, we stop. And we know that because we've already sorted that the ones to the left will also not be too big. So really what's important is how many elements to the left of a given element are bigger than it. That's the key quantity that we need to look at. So the number of comparisons required to move AI to its correct position It's 1 plus the number of elements to the left of it which are greater than it. So look at the set of all j such that aj is bigger than ai but j is less than i. Look at that set and look at its size, its cardinality. That is the number of comparisons needed to move that element back to the right position. So the total number of comparisons needed, we have to sum over all i. Okay, now we do it for n minus 1 values of i, and so we have a sum there. And then, now what are we looking at here? We're looking for all i, we look at the number of elements j, which are, sorry, for all indices i, we look at all indices j less than it, where elements are out of order. So if you think about how that's working, we're actually picking up, if we, every pair of elements that's out of order, we pick it up exactly once. We have a pair of elements, when i gets to be equal to this one, it gets looked at and not otherwise. So what I'm trying to say here is that we get the set of all pairs i, j such that i is greater than j but a, j is greater than a, i. Okay. And such an element such a, a pair is called an inversion. It's some kind of out of orderness inside the input. So for example, if I have 2, 3, 4, 1, 5, this is an inversion if I'm using the normal ordering. This pair is not because it's in the right order. This is also an inversion. 2, 1 is an inversion, and that's all. There are no more. Now I want to focus on these inversions. Let's just first note that we're also measuring uh, swaps or data moves as well as comparisons. But it's clear that the number of swaps in this swap version is very close to the number of comparisons. In fact, you just don't have this 1 plus here. And this is the extra comparison you do when you finally got to the right place and you have to check that you are in the right place. If you're looking at the data move version rather than the swap version, it's slightly different, but it is the case that the number of moves or swaps is very close to the number of inversions. So we want to go ahead and look at inversions. So the best case for insertion sort is where you have an already sorted input and there are no inversions whatsoever there. You know there that you'll have to do only n minus 1 comparisons, and in fact this will be 0 here, and you'll have to do no swaps or moves. On the other hand, the worst case is a lot worse, 
The worst case is when you have everything in reverse sorted order. So every possible pair is going to give you an inversion, and the number of inversions is n times n minus 1 over 2. It's just the number of ways you can choose two things out of n. So here you have zero inversions, here you have this many, this is the best case, and this is the worst case. So this is very interesting. Unlike selection sort, insertion sort has very different performance in its best and worst case. Selection sort was very insensitive to the input. It just did a lot of work, no matter what. Here you can do a lot of work in the worst case, which is bad news. The good news, though, is that if your input is already close to sorted, it has a small number of inversions, then your running time is actually going to be pretty good. Insertion sort is often used as a final pass by a lot of other sorting algorithms. They start off, do the heavy work in reducing the number of inversions quickly, but then when you get to the, a point where there aren't that many left, insertion sort is pretty quick, and sometimes it's best to invoke it then, zoom through and tidy everything up. As an example, suppose you have a big sorted database, you like to keep it sorted for various reasons. And during the day, various things are inserted into it which ruin the order, but you want to keep it sorted every night. As long as you don't have that many changes to your database during the day, it should be still fairly close to sorted, and you could probably just run insertion sort on it quickly. Obviously, however, if you're doing a lot of changes, it's not going to be a very good idea to use insertion sort, at least if we can find a better algorithm. We don't have any yet, but we will soon see some. Here we are again with the questions at the end of the lecture. We've seen the best and worst case of insertion sort, but what happens on average? That's a very obvious question to think about. In terms of basic properties, we know that insertion sort is in place, but is it stable? As we did for selection sort, think about the difference between an array and linked list implementation of insertion sort, and whether there are any important differences in performance. What happens if we use binary search to find the correct insertion point instead of just scanning back sequentially as we've been doing in the implementation of insertion sort? Why don't we do that? Final question. It's pretty clear from the way that we analyzed it that every time we do a single swap with insertion sort, we only remove one inversion from the input. We get a pair that's out of order and we make them in order without changing anything else. If we want to do better than that and be much faster, we're going to have to get rid of more inversions. Maybe one way of doing this is to make larger moves, swap elements that are further apart from each other. It's a more speculative question. Have a think about it. Is there a way that you can think of that will do that and improve on insertion sort?